What's up, folks? It's Dr. Remy LeBeau here. I'm here in the X-Lair waiting impatiently for 9.30 to come around. That's in 45 minutes. At that point, I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive to the movie theater, and I am going to watch, finally, X-Men, Days of Future Past, the newest X-Men film by Brian Singer that brings together the cast from the past, the cast from the future, fixes everything that Brad Ratner ruined in the X-Men franchise. It's going to be amazing. My mind is about to be blown multiple times, and I cannot wait to share my thoughts with you when I get back. So stay tuned. All right, so I just got back. <laughs> and I finally saw X-Men Days of Future Past by Brian Singer. Um, the film... So. The, before I get into anything, I just want to be very clear about what's going to happen here. I, I'm not going to spoil anything in the first part, and then uh, so I'm going to break the video up into several segments, and the second segment and beyond will have spoilers, but this first segment will not have spoilers. This first segment is basically just to give you my thoughts on uh, the overall the overall impression that the film left on me and just how I feel about the experience. And then I'll go into story, directing, blah, 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 in uh, subsequent sections. So these are my these are my opening thoughts, okay? Uh, holy crap, that movie was perfect. It was perfect. It was the perfect X-Men movie. It was everything that it was promised to be. I thought quite a bit about what this film could end up being, the sort of the plot twists, the implications for the film series. And this, and and I, of course, I had really high expectations, and the film just blew my expectations out of the water. It took it took me places that I did not expect, and the places that I did expect for it to take me were a very satisfying, and b done so well that um, I couldn't have asked for anything more. So my only my only regret about the film is that it's over. <laughs> If it could have been a four-hour film, I would have taken a four-hour film. That that's how good this film is to me. Uh, all the all the all the pieces I needed to come together for this film to become what it became came together, and so it's a flawless film experience. If you're an X Men fan, if you're a fan of film, um, I don't see any reason how you could dislike this this movie. It's the perfect summer movie. Um, please, if if you have any kind of reservations about going to see this movie, you must get over your reservations and you must get your butt out the door and watch this film because it's totally worth your time and it's totally uh, appropriate for the big screen. It must be seen in the big screen. So. Okay, so it's just on a rating scale out of 10, I give it a 9.89. 9.89, 9 I give the film. No, nothing is perfect. Um, it's an excellent film. I, just on any other scale, like good, you know, bad to like excellent, it's excellent. Um, just too many good things to say about it. So. So that concludes just my overall impression of the film. It's as ambiguous as I can be. And from this point forward, I'm going to get into uh, a variety of things. Uh, specifically, first, I'm going to talk about the story. Then I'm going to talk about the film directing. Then I'm going to talk about the filmmaking, the other aspects of the film making process beyond directing. Uh, I'm going to talk about editing, uh, production design, music design. Uh, then I'm going to get into acting and the characters and uh, and then and then I'm going to talk about the implications of the film for the franchise and of course finally I'll just have some concluding thoughts for you so get ready for some exciting analysis of this incredible film that I just saw X-Men Days of Future Past All right, now we're gonna get into spoilers. Now I'm going to talk about the story and there's going to, there are going to be plenty of spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film and don't want the film to be spoiled, then at this point, turn off the video, put me in your watch later list and come back after you finish watching the film and 
listen listen to what I have to say and then chime in in the comments. Let me know what you think, and we can have a little dialogue about it. All right. So the story, uh, I love the story. It it was um, it was exactly what it needed to be. It was the thing that tied all the films together, like the entire film series that that was starting to feel very fractured. Things were starting to feel as though they were just part of different universes and yet we were always led to believe they were part of the same universe. The, the, the common threads were unraveling throughout the series, but this film brought the threads back together. It, 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 it now is the cornerstone um, of the foundation for this film series. Uh, from this point forward, uh, I doubt that there will be any sort of confusion about the world that we're all that that we're witnessing in this film, in the in the subsequent films, and and the implications that those that, that the world has uh, throughout throughout the various films and and uh, and in the continuing story. It it. it it's everything's been fixed <laughs> everything like the downward spiral that was um x-men the last stand that that that, that x-men the last stand started has now ended <laughs> and the slate has been wiped clean and we are now back at a point where we can actually enjoy the stories and not always and not always kind of feel frustrated about the fact that the story was broken Thank goodness for that. <laughs> that makes me really happy. It's really great when you have like a series of films that you really enjoy. Uh, and this has happened a few times the last few years, the last maybe 10 years where, you know, you have maybe like a couple of really great films and then you have a terrible third film. And it, it really creates a problem for people like me that like to just sit down and watch movies uh, like back to back. You know, when you have a couple of really good films like X-Men and X-Men 2, and then you would finish off that story with just like something terrible like X-Men 3 and it just made you it just that makes you not want to watch the series it makes you just want to avoid the whole thing uh, this happened with Scream as well the Scream the original Scream tr trilogy uh, I know it's like a poor sort of uh, comparison but it did happen where they did a couple of good films I liked the first two Screams then the third one was basically shit so that was broken for a very long time and then they made Scream 4 and I don't care what people think about Scream 4 personally it was for me it was basically like going back to basics going back to uh, what the film series was like bringing it back together and so F Scream 4 really sort of made that experience a better experience overall and now X-Men Days of Future Past has done the exact same thing for this entire film series including with X-Men First Class because X-Men First Class was a good film and I really enjoyed it and it really brought a lot a lot of life back into the film series but it didn't fix the problems that had that the pre prior films had created and and it, there were there were a lot of plot points where it just everything was sort of disconnected from the original series so it didn't really feel like part of the original series it kind of felt slightly like a reboot even though it wasn't Fortunately, this film, X-Men Days of Future Past, is not only a sequel to the original uh, set of films, but also to X-Men First Class in a way that just tied everything together. Everything was tied together perfectly. Uh, the, the things that were, not, that were not left tied together were, you know, it's like you, we understand that now the potential exists for very sort of logical connections to be established that will fill in these like narrative gaps that were created you know over the various years with all, all these various sort of different approaches to the film so even the things that weren't necessarily completely cleared up like let's say the relationship between havoc and uh cyclops the summers people <laughs> we they're supposed to be brothers but who knows what they are in these films um it's still sort of like the connection I'm sure will eventually be explored. I'm going to assume it'll be explored in the next film. The next film is going to be X-Men Apocalypse. And uh, the two brothers were always, uh, Cyclops and Havoc were sort of like a an important, uh, they, were, they, were, they were definitely an important element of the Age of Apocalypse storyline. So I can kind of see where maybe the next film will kind of take us down 
the path of understanding the relationship between Havoc and Scott. So that that's just one of the things where I, you know, I, I feel like I still would like a little bit more, uh, you know, explanation, but it doesn't matter at this point. Like, I'm really happy that this film happened to just do a lot for the stories. And so I, I'm, I'm okay with not everything being sort of explained at this point because I know there's more films to come. So, so you know, I, I can be patient about that given what I have just experienced, given something... Given the fact that I've I've witnessed something that has broken something that that fixed something that was broken a long time ago and has always kind of stung me a bit and all the X Men fans in the world in general at least people around my age like I think f have felt the same way and this movie will rectify that feeling and just change things so fortunately that happened and everybody gets to have that and um, there's just there's that's great <laughs> that's just great. Um, okay, so story. I love how I love how the film interwove the past and the future together. It, it was really nice. Uh, it was. I didn't feel like I there wasn't enough of the future stuff with the old X Men cast in it. I felt like it was enough. It was present enough throughout the entire film that that you know i got my fill of what i wanted out of it like and and you see all the characters do things in those scenes that satisfy like our expectations for what we expect of these characters obviously you have this very you have this very sa sort of saturated film in terms of uh, how many you know mutants were in it and it's a difficult thing to be able to to have that many characters in a film and so and 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 not and not let a lot of the characters sort of just feel like they're part of like a background or something. I felt like in the future scenes, like we 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 didn't get to know like all the all the sort of the future like um, like army of mutants, like the the X Men of the future that were you know like Sunspot and and Blink and uh, Bishop, like. We didn't get to know them, but I, I didn't really feel we really needed to get to know them. They were there, as, you know, as sort of like the soldiers of the X-Men. And and they could have just been any old soldiers, but, you know, the, the creators of the film put in characters that are familiar in order to make the fans happy, in order to make it feel, you know, in every way an X-Men film. And so I, I was just, it was just great to see these characters and see them use their powers we see a lot more of their powers being used in the film than in the uh, that in the trailers that we've seen. So, so that was really exciting. I I really love that. Uh, I, li I I love seeing the old cast. Um, obviously, Ian, I, I'm not going to talk about the acting yet, but this as far as the story goes, like you know, uh, Magneto, Kitty, uh, Iceman, everybody like that was in it was oh, Colossus. Everybody that was in it was in it a sufficient amount to sort of give us uh give us fans what we want from those characters so super satisfied with that um the present the the stuff in the in the 1970s it was fantastic just fantastic i really love the way the story played out i was interested in what was happening the entire time uh, just from the beginning moments when I mean you you basically under you basically knew what was going to happen in the in the sort of the the opening scenes of like the past you know with like Wolverine and then like Wolverine going to Xavier's and trying to get him to you know become part of this sort of mission to change the future and you know Beast getting involved and then and then them having to break Magneto out of prison like this was all understood uh, to happen but I like it happened quickly so it wasn't like the that it wasn't like it was the entire film it was it was like the things that we saw just and that was what was also very clever about the marketing it's like a lot everything we saw was really great it was like the, the spectacle was there the characters were there um, it drew us into the world and made us want to watch the film but I, I knew when I was watching that stuff that all that stuff was really from the beginning like we're not we weren't gonna see everything that was gonna happen in the film we were only going to see um, you know a lot of like the really cool stuff that happens at first 
so that when we're actually watching the film, we can be surprised and, and actually enjoy you know, this experience for the first time rather than just constantly saying, oh yes, I, I knew this was gonna happen. So the, they're really good about doing that, the, the, the filmmakers for this film. So ha super happy about that. Um, so yeah, so the following the characters in the past and just going from one scene to the next, uh, the the prison break, um, the Quicksilver scene was fantastic. Going from there to uh, Paris and then just kind of following what was happening with Trask and him trying to get the Sentinel program uh, off the ground and just, and then all the characters trying to stop Mystique uh, from, you know, making the big mistake, which is essentially to kill Trask. Uh, which then gets her captured, which then leads to the scientist being able to adapt her powers to the machines, which then become the killer sentinels in the future. So, you know, I, I loved how the story just followed all these characters trying to sort of stop her, but then all, all individually also dealing with their own stuff, including Logan, inclu including Logan when he saw Stryker. That was so great. It was, there was so much in the film that was like always constantly like just forming connections like kind of like they were like filmic grappling hooks that were just like kind of being thrown out of each scene and just kind of grabbing you know all these disjunctive parts of the films uh from the various series from the entire series and just kind of pulling them into like you know the story so that it, so that all these parts are like kind of grounding us and grounding the connections and grounding you know the the continuity of all these films it was just fantastic and then of course the the uh the climax was just spectacular um and uh yeah just so so the story was fantastic i love i, I mean you basically knew what was going to happen in a sense but you know whatever like it, it sort of it went it went through its arc in a way that was engaging the entire time and i, I loved it the entire step of the way. I mean, I, I knew that Mystique, I knew that they would stop Mystique and that they would change the future. I didn't know how. I had an idea that it, the movie was going to result in like a, a future where things are back to normal and like the X Men are back in the X Mansion and just, it was so great. And, and we see Gene, we see Gene and we see Cyclops and and we even see Beast. We even see Kelsey Grammer's Beast, which was fantastic. It's like everybody's back at the X Mansion and things are back the way they should be at the very end. It was just, it was the most satisfying thing ever to, to see that, to see that be the case, to finally have these moments that I've imagined, you know, because I, I, I knew that Brian Singer intended to do this. And so to finally actually see it happen, it was, it was breathtaking. It was just breathtaking on both like a physical level and also sort of like a mental level. Like my mind was the breath, my mind's breath was like taken away. Um, it's just wonderful, just wonderful. Um, and then of course there's the after credit sequence, which, um, <laughs> which was really, really cool. Um, they introduced, they introduced Apocalypse uh, in the past, um, you have, you have, you know, all his followers in like ancient Egypt and they're like, En Saba Nur, En Saba Nur, En Saba Nur, En Saba Nur. You know, it was like, it was, it was exactly what I wanted it to be. And he was like, he was like constructing the pyramids with his mutant power. It, it was, um, it's just, I can't even say what it was because it was just the coolest thing ever. Um, I, 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 it's like, it's so good. The film is so good to, for me and I'm sure it will be for you. And as far as rot Rotten Tomatoes goes, like they're at 91% right now. And, and I think there's like over a hundred reviews. So, I mean, that, that number speaks for itself as well. Like it's a great film. It's a great film. The story, fantastic. So, uh, that that uh, that's those are my thoughts on the story. I, I don't need to get more into it because at this point, I'm sure you've already seen the film, so you understand everything that happened in it. Uh, it was it was, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to assume that you're as satisfied as I as I was 
with the film. So, so yay. I mean, super, super yay. Thank you. Okay, now it's time to talk about the film directing, the direction of the film. The film was directed by Brian Singer. Brian Singer went to USC Film School. I went to USC Film School. I, I, I was taught a rigorous filmmaking program at the same school as him. The, the program that I actually got my degree from, this was years ago, I graduated in 2000 from there. Um, the, the, the program that I graduated from is now being renamed the Brian Singer program so it's like a so it Brian Singer embodies like what it is to be um, a, a, per, a precise perfect filmmaker he embodies that uh, filmmaking y yes it's a, it, you know like it's an art of course it's an art form and but like over over the last you know century and a, and a half or so not century and a half about uh, over the last century basically you know, filmmaking has been innovated throughout the world at, in various phases, and that all led to sort of a sort of an academic um, way of of approaching filmmaking. You know, it's like just all sorts of styles were developed at various times throughout the world, and then the best parts of those styles were were then taken and analyzed and then made to be sort of like the benchmark for what makes a good film. And that is what I learned in the program, and that is what Brian Singer learned in the program, and that's what John Carpenter learned in the program, and um, and George Lucas learned in the program. So uh, <laughs> I have to I have to comment on the Brian Singer like scandal thing. I, I I'm really disappointed by this whole situation. I, 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 I mean, obviously, like all this news came out like a month before the film came out. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to pass judgment on the guy. We live in a place, in a world where people are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, it's from everything that I've been reading and seeing. It's, it seems very evident that we have we're dealing with an opportunist, at least the lawyers, an opportunist. And they're just trying to smear Brian Singer's name uh, at the time that his biggest film is being released. So I, I, I mean, as far as what actually happened, you know, we'll let the courts decide that these are going to be civil suits. They're not even criminal suits. They're civil suits. They're obviously, these people are obviously just out for money. Um, but they chose a time to, to sort of bring about these charges that obviously was meant to make Brian Singer, like kind of push him into a corner. Uh, they probably threatened him beforehand. Um, and and probably try to extort money out of him. That's my assumption. I don't know exactly what the case is. My point is that I, I charges aside, I feel really bad for Brian Singer because I I, I I I mean, there's a very good chance that these charges are not true, and so he he had to miss out on the glory that he would have gotten from just being part of the marketing for the film, being able to like go around the world and talk to various news outlets about the film because hearing from him like I think is was just like the missing component like this whole in this whole process because obviously he's at the heart of the film and I and and because he's such a great filmmaker there was everything about this film that's great comes from him and so it's due to him that I just had the, the best X-Men film experience of my life, and, and most fans will as well. And uh, so that's all I'm gonna say about the scandal, but I, like, I had to mention it because it's just, it's been really playing on me and, and like all the fans and people throughout the world. Like, and there, you know, this, the, the whole situation can be debated, but I don't, I don't wanna debate it. What I want is just to, just to look at the film as a piece of film art by an artistic filmmaker and just leave it at that the film would not be what it is again if it wasn't for brian singer's talent um, every single shot in the film was perfect everything was set up to be beautiful even the most uh, sort of uh, just non-consequential things were shot in a way that was interesting and that's what that's what you're taught at film school you're taught to to make art in every frame 
and but it's not just the framing it's it's uh the pacing the pacing of the film is fantastic the pacing of individual scenes the pacing of individual shots the pacing of a sequence of shots these things are critical to a an effective film going experience that and by effective i mean a film that really kind of draws you in and keeps you there the entire time the the things that stand out the most to me i mean just the blink scenes were really fantastic like i'll start with those because they were sort of at the start of the film like all the stuff with her like being able to create her portals just visually just were fantastic and this brings us this this really the best example of what brian singer can do in a film like this is the opening sequence from x-men 2. he took nightcrawler's power and he made the most incredible sequence he did that several times in this film and one of the things that he exploited quite a bit were were the blink scenes i thought the blink scenes were just fantastic visually um and as far as like playing with like space and time just brilliant i loved it it, it and it, it's really what it's it's just incredible it's a it was a it was a great approach to sort of uh showing demonstrating blink's powers in the film so i was really happy about that uh the way the way that that the sequences were presented and uh everything that was happening in the sequences because everything that was happening was already spectacle so if you just kind of shoot it simply that's really enough for the audience to like it but you know brian singer as a as a visual filmmaker as an actual and artistic filmmaker that's constantly thinking about the, the moving image he he made he made those scenes interesting to like the the thousandth degree just took it to a level that it needed to go to and um and that that's just one example i love all the stuff in the 1970s uh where he used a lot of like i think it was like it might have been like seven uh like eight millimeter uh shots like you he had a lot of people at different places and, and these places were like government sort of events so you you would think you would have people with like you know super eight cameras all over the place like shooting stuff and he and he had them and then he would like cut to the the shots that that were being shot through these eight millimeter film cameras and that was and that was a nod so that's a nod to like filmmaking he that that's part of what we're taught at, at the film school which is like celebrate filmmaking in a film uh another thing he did there was a scene where eric was like looking at uh the he was projecting like some film slides that some film that he that he got which showed the blueprints for the sentinels and he was like he created like a projector out of just like a light and it was brilliant that's another nod to like film history like anytime you're like you kind of like look at film in a way in within a film that kind of like calls attention to it and sort of its technological history that's sort of a, a tradition in filmmaking and, and generally like a sign of a of a filmmaker that has studied film and you know it, it is laudatory towards like the filmmaking history uh that that sort of brought you know one to this point where you're making a particular film that so those moments were just they were kind of breathtaking for me as just like a, a student of film um <laughs> there's just like the magic that made the first two films great and and really x-men 2 is like the pinnacle right not just of the series but of quite a bit of films in general um the things that made those movies great made this movie great and it was consistent throughout the entire film you could tell that brian singer was hungry to make a really good x-men film so many years after he left the series to go do superman returns so, you know i'm sure all these years and just hearing all the stuff from the fans and then seeing what brett ratner did like all this like he had like a lot of pent up sort of drive to kind of like put things back the way they should be and he he did not hold back in in anything like the the shots just gorgeous beautiful seamless 
perfect filmmaking. Oh. Um, the best sequence in the film, the absolute best sequence in the film was the Quicksilver sequence when they break out Eric and he's just, and he and and they're confronted by like I don't know maybe 12 uh, Pentagon employees that are just about to take them all down and and the moment is slowed down to a crawl and there's like this really great song that comes on that's like ironic and uh, and then and then there's like this really amazing sequence of just Quicksilver just running around the room it's going super slow even taking a moment to like taste um, some I don't know maybe it was peanut butter or pudding or something in a bowl that was spilling um, as he was running and then just you know with him in normal time in his own relative normal time just like slowly kind of putting everybody in a position all these like 12 guards in a position where they're just gonna knock each other out and moving the bullets they had shot uh, towards Eric and Charles and and Logan so that they their trajectory would change and, and it would miss their targets um, once that sequence was over, the audience just cheered and broke out in applause. That's how good of a sequence it was. That was probably the best sequence of any X-Men film, even better than the Nightcrawler sequence for me. Um, and it was just one of those moments that kind of brought tears to my eyes. It was so good. It was done so well. Um, everything else was just... Everything else in the film visually was exactly what it needed to be and I knew the film was gonna be what it what I saw it just when the, the since the first moment I heard that Brian Singer was gonna come back and make this film I, I might have even mentioned this in some of the earlier videos in my in my on my channel I might have mentioned the fact that that the film was and had been announced and that Brian Singer would become the the director and that I immediately knew in my mind that it was going to be as great of a film as it turned out to be it's undeniable like the when you put a good director on a good film nothing nothing can go wrong you're only gonna get a great filmmaking experience so uh, because of that uh, there's I can only say great things about the filmmaking and I mean by the off chance that somebody um, happens to have Brian Singer's ear. I, I just want to thank Brian Singer. Thank you, Brian Singer, uh, for for making such a great film and for making myself a student of film at the same film school as yourself. Just um, just uh, you know, put me in a in a in a cinematic euphoria state. So thank you for that. And so that concludes my part uh, of, of this of this review dealing with the filmmaking the directing aspect of the filmmaking. Thank you. So I wanted to get some thoughts out on other aspects of the filmmaking beyond the directing. The directing was flawless. I couldn't be more happy with it. Uh, the other elements of the film were incredible as well. I mean, I can't say anything bad about them. I love, okay, so I'll start with the music. Love the music. Um, I, I just the hearing the original score of the X-Men films and and having like that opening sequence with you know just the classic like being taken through like some digital like uh, you know a, a double helix DNA uh, strand you know electrified and then that leading to like the actual title um, and then it getting us to the point where like, you know, we see the cerebro, um, yeah, the cerebro door, like that, you know, that opens up to cerebro. That, that was just, um, I mean, that began the journey. That began like this journey into this, back into this film series. Like the, the, it began like the healing process that was this film. So fantastic I love the music throughout the entire film they didn't use the music from first class which I really liked a lot I really liked first class soundtrack like the Magneto theme and like the last music the music that played over the credits fantastic really liked it quite a bit but they went a different direction with this film and I thought it was I thought it was appropriate because this film takes place 10 years after first class 
So it's like it was a different time. Like it's a different story. It, the 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 weight of everything that was happening in the film was way heavier than than what was happening in the original film from the beginning from the get-go you know you weren't introducing a bunch of characters you were just kind of like in the middle of a story so and the story was serious so the the soundtrack was serious but there were some moments just like like the quick Quil- quicksilver moment where you had kind of like that sort of fun 70s I, I i forget what song it was but it was like the perfect song that was kind of commenting on on speed and time or something it was but it was like kind of hokey like it, it you know um like a Vegas lounge singer would sing. It, it was like, it was perfect. And, and that was like perfect counterpoint to like the, the seriousness of the story and, uh, and, the, and the serious sort of tone of like the music that sort of went throughout the entire film. So, uh, uh, so all that stuff was just fantastic. Really great. Uh, it, it, the, the tone of the film it's super important. It's a super important element of the film. The music really has a lot to, to do with that. So, uh, perfection. That's all I can say. Okay, another really important aspect of the filmmaking uh, in, the, in any film is the cinematography. And the cinematography in this movie was just fantastic. Um, there was like high contrast, like grainy, a lot of images, a lot of sort of shadows, like... Uh, the color palette also the production the production design the color palette uh, was dark also the colors were dark but not too dark because it's still an X-Men film you know and you've got all these colorful characters so you don't want to just make it the dark night because then it becomes like the dark night right and that wasn't what it was going for it had its own sort of like desaturated color palette uh, there was a lot of like grays and blacks and whites um, and it was very appropriate. It was very appropriate for the film. I didn't feel like it wasn't. It wasn't. It was out of place. It felt completely in place. And of course, that's Brian Singer d- surrounds himself with with professionals. And I'm going to assume all these people have also gone to film school too. So if you have a great cinematographer on a film like this, the cinematographer has studied the history of cinematography, knows cinematography as a science and an art. And it was evident in this film that all the cinematography throughout it was like very intentional and really complemented the film the film uh, style perfectly. Um, so another really important aspect of the production design were were of the production design aside from the color palette was the design of. Well, everything, the wardrobe, blah, blah, blah. But what most important, the most important thing was the Sentinels, the actual Sentinels in the future and in the past. Now, the future Sentinels, they, you know, the story explained that they had sort of Trask and, and, and Trask Industries had figured out how to take Mystique's power and apply it to, uh, you know, a Sentinel in order to then, you know, turn, have these Sentinels become sort of able to adapt to mutants via other mutants powers uh, and it, it was really it was really great i love i love how they did it and and it was very cool but i the look of the sentinels i didn't like as much they were fine but the look of the sentinels in the past were really freaking cool they were just like they were uh, you know it's like it's difficult to translate certain you know sort of fantastic comic book elements into reality i thought they did a fan these these films have always well at least the first two films and now this one and first class does a really good job of like translating these like uh bigger than life elements into things that are not completely hokey and maybe more stylized and i think they did a really good job with the sentinels i really like the sentinel design i thought the whole sequence towards the end with all the sentinels that that uh, magneto had sort of taken control of which was fucking which is freaking great and like unexpected, uh, was um, it, it was a great sequence and they look great. The Sentinels look fantastic. Uh, they kind of reminded me of a, a design that was used in X Men Evolution, which I really liked. Just kind of like this dark faceplate with like these really bright eyes. Fantastic. Uh, so th- that's really like the most important uh, aspect of the film as far as like production design that sort of was 
really important because you know we've all sort of been wanting Sentinels for a really long time. We finally got them, and I feel I I'm very satisfied with what I saw, both in the past and in the future. But I really like the design of the Sentinels in the past. Um, so overall, all the elements of the filmmaking, aside from the well, the directing, obviously in and of itself, amazing. All the element, all the rest of the elements of the filmmaking, fantastic. Just great. Thank you, Brian Singer, and everybody else that, that worked on the film. Thank you. All right. Um, it was great. So now I want to talk about the characters and the actors. It was great to finally get uh, the actors back from the original film series. They did a fantastic job. I felt that Halle Berry should have maybe had a little bit more of a speaking role in the film, which is understandable why then I haven't seen her do much marketing. I'm, I'm assuming that she wasn't completely happy with the fact that she was kind of, you know, put into the background of these film of this film, but it's understandable given like, you know, the structure of the film, what was happening in the film. I really liked all the characters in the future. Like I've already mentioned, I like Blink, but I like Blink as a character too. She was like, she was well presented. She it was serious. It wasn't just like silly. And then you had Warpath and Sunspot. Loved when Sunspot flew away and started. You know, I, I didn't know if he was going to fly, but he did fly. So I was really happy with that. Warpath was great. Um, <clears throat> Iceman really loved the Iceman stuff. Um, obviously, Kitty Pride played a key role, and I really liked uh, what she did in that. What she did in her her role in the film and and the implications of her being there. Of course, Hugh Jackman just killed it as he generally does. But I really got, I really felt like the the first two X Men film, Wolverine. I felt it, it was Wolverine again. Like it wasn't like you know Hugh Jackman kind of like just trying to be happy with things that weren't really working. I'm sure. Like I, you can kind of tell in the other films. Like aside from the Wolverine, you can kind of tell in the other films that things were kind of moving along in, in weird ways and, and he kind of felt that I think that was my perspective but in this film just it was it was Wolverine in in the best form he just he killed it in the present in the uh, in the future and in the past really liked what they did with the character and it was really interesting um, at the very end when we saw sort of mystique take Wolverine. So that's an interesting sort of situation that I'm looking forward to seeing explored a little bit more. It's looking it's looking like good, some good stuff there uh, that's going to happen in the next film. So that, and it also implies that Jackman will be in the next film. So I'm really happy about that. Um, of course, James McAvoy did a great job. Patrick Stewart, of course, great. Xavier's back, thank you. Um, Ian McKellen killed it as Magneto again, and he always will. Uh, but of course, uh, Michael Fassbender, I love Michael Fassbender as Magneto and he did not disappoint in this film. I was really happy with everything that he did. I look forward to seeing it again and seeing all his parts. Some, some of my favorite parts from First Class are um, the, the parts that feature Fassbender as Magneto. Just love it. Love everything they did in First Class with him and love how they continued it here. The, and I, I love how we finally get to see it. I love how it, it, no matter no matter what the situation is, like the story always comes back to him being a villain. And Michael Fassbender plays Magneto as a villain so well, just impeccably. Just love it. Um, and Jennifer Lawrence, fantastic as always. She is a great actress. Obviously, she won the Best Actress uh, Oscar. She does a great job in The Hunger Games. She does a great job as Mystique. I really would like to have her uh, have her own film as a uh, uh, have a like a standalone mystique film I think it would be fantastic I hope they do that if they don't so be it uh, and of course there's also uh, her real life fiance who I, I forget his name but he, he played Beast did a great job so all the characters just exploited so well seeing all their powers in very sort of very cinematic ways as only Brian Singer can do with the X Men. I mean, other other directors could do it too. Matthew Vaughn did it, but I mean, really, Brian Singer created this. So he he exploited all the characters and their power so well. I I can't say anything bad about. It. I just it's hard to say anything bad about any aspect of this film, and and that's just wonderful. That's just a wonderful thing. So yeah, really happy with the actors and the characters.
All right, so the implications of this film, um, they're huge, they're huge, the implications, because uh, first of all, they basically establish a world where X-Men 3 never happened, so that's really great, but then it kind of leaves us, us in a situation where it's like, can Jean become the Phoenix again, and if so, can we finally see a Phoenix story that, you know, was sort of what was intended for the Phoenix story to be, you know, before Brian Singer left, because I've, I've seen some stuff on online where the writers of X2 sort of talked about what X-Men 3 was supposed to be and how Jean was going to sort of evolve into this this higher being. And then at the at the end of the film, she would actually leave the planet because she evolved beyond just being a human being on on planet Earth and just kind of being connected to the universe. Uh, the, there's there was so much potential there that just was never reached um, and just I uh, just visually like the firebird right like we saw the firebird under the water at the end of x2 and then they just completely ignored it in x3 they, they didn't even try to like demonstrate her powers like this firebird like why not why not do that but having gene back now it's very possible that we could actually ex at some point in the near future, hopefully, have an X Men film where they actually do the Phoenix story right this time. I, I can I can see it potentially happening. Hopefully, they will. I'm gonna cross my fingers about it. So Cyclops is back too. Cyclops never died. Yay! Everybody's back at the school. Good. <laughs> things are back. Things seem to be back to normal. So I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. They have this film X Men Apocalypse plan, which I'm very excited about. It's gonna be in, it's gonna come out in 2016. Obviously, it's going to focus on Apocalypse as the villain and like this old ancient mutant, which I'm very excited about. And it's going to it's going to focus on the first class cast in the in the 80s. I've heard that Quicksilver is going to be back. So we have Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique, James McAvoy as Xavier, Magneto, and of course Wolverine is going to be in it too. So there's uh, a lot of stuff <clears throat> that is looking really good. In regards to this film, but I, I, and I know a lot of other fans too would really love to have a, a new film with the old cast in it. Hopefully, they'll do it. I recommend they do it, but you know they're not going to listen to me. Um, I, I kind of feel like this film also erases X Men Origins Wolverine, like it erases it from existence as well. At the end of this film, uh, Wolverine is with is is with. Um, is with Mystique, who's actually dressed up as uh, as Striker from from X Men Two, the young Striker. So, you know how what how that's going to work out. Who knows? I'm sure that there will be a lot more stuff in the next film that will kind of establish a new route for what's going to happen with Wolverine. Um, maybe they'll even have him get his adamantium into a skeleton because in the comics. Apocalypse is the one responsible for getting his adamantium back after Magneto had taken it out. So Wolverine didn't have his adamantium for a very long time and then Apocalypse put it back in. So with Apocalypse in the next film, they could totally just kind of like ignore um, all the Weapon X stuff and just have Apocalypse give him adamantium. Like that would be interesting. I would be interested in seeing that sort of play out. And then just ignore, and then that sort of just wiping the slate clean as far as like X Men Origins Wolverine goes, and just taking everything in a brand new direction, which would be really ideal. Really ideal. <laughs> I hope it happens. I hope it happens. Um, so again, I hope that happens. I hope a new, a new old old cast film happens as well. Um, and of course, there's been news that Gambit's going to be in the next one. It's going to be—he's going to be played by Channing Tatum, which I'm happy about. And then that—that's going to lead into a Gambit solo film. I'm really kind of excited about that. Seeing, I'm, I'm excited to see where that's going to go, and how that's going to tie into everything. Because obviously, at this point, they know that the cinematic universe needs to be threaded together very tightly. So I know that they're not going to do anything stupid again. I, I'm pretty much convinced they're not going to do anything stupid again. But because they, if this if this film makes as much money as I'm pretty much I'm pretty sure it's going to make, then it it will correct not only the course of the continuity of the films, but also 
the course that the film franchise sort of veered off of uh, after the third film. Like the films haven't been as successful as the third one was. And I, f I have a feeling this is going to put it back into that category of like films that are really profitable and thus worth making well. So that's another important implication, just business from the business side of it. Um, and that's basically it. Like, and these are all great things. Obviously, the like I already mentioned, like the the after credit sequence with with Apocalypse, it's just too good. It's just too good, and I, I want to see more now. Two thousand sixteen, I'm coming for you. Two thousand sixteen, I am coming for you. Thank you. All right, folks, that is going to conclude my uh, review of X-Men Days of Future Past. It is May the 23rd now. I saw it May 22nd a few hours ago, 2014. The film was exactly what I wanted it to be. I'm going to go watch it again this weekend without a doubt. Um, I can't wait to have it in my collection and to do a an entire marathon of these films finally and have that marathon end on a good note oh boy that's that's just a relief um all of you at least some of you know like i am a big x-men fan i've got x-men throughout the my my home um you've seen my collection of x-men statues uh x-men is is a passion for me i started i started being into x-men like when i was 13 years old a friend of mine uh me and a friend were at a, at a bookstore and we saw some comics and we bought them and, and that was it. That was the end of that. Like from that point forward, I love the X-Men. And um, it, there's nothing more satisfying than to see, uh, and also being a student of film, like having the character, the my favorite characters in all of sort of pop culture uh, being put into a film where the filmmaking is flawless and the storytelling is flawless and everything is flawless. Um, for a fan like myself, there is just no better. There, there, there's nothing better than this. So, I just I'm, I'm concluding my thoughts during the conclusion of one of the best moments of my life. So, thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you for checking out my video. Again, um, my uh, YouTube channel is Dr. Rami Lebeau's X Lair. If you enjoyed this review and the other stuff that I do. Uh, I invite you to subscribe and you know keep keep track of of the content that that I release. It's heavily related to X Men statues and X Men, but I'm branching out. I'm doing these reviews like this review I did today of one of my favorite films ever, X Men Days of Future Past. Um, so there's plenty more stuff to come. And as always, it's important that you put an X in that box because ain't nobody checking me. Ain't nobody checking me. En Sabanur. En Sabanur. En Sabanur.